Seeing no further introductions, it's therefore time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Yesterday, we learned disturbing new details about this government's deleted document scandal in the Trillium Power lawsuit. We've learned that documents appear to have been destroyed or deleted by this Liberal government. Speaker, that's why, on behalf of our leader, Doug Ford, the PC party has written to the Information and Privacy Commissioner seeking an investigation into what exactly happened to these lawsuit documents. This government has had six years, six years, Speaker, to find the documents we know exist. The lawyers against the government provided evidence these files were deliberately destroyed or deleted. This is the gas plant scandal all Question. over. Speaker, I ask the Premier, are we really going to do this all over again? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member well knows, um, we can't. Um, I heard a member say something. I'm not sure exactly which member it was, and they'll know what I'm talking about. I don't want those kinds of references used in the heckling, and if it is, I'll ask you to withdraw, and then the second time it's used, I'll start naming people. Carry on. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker. As said before, and as the opposition well knows, we can't comment specifically on the lawsuit from Trillium Power, as the matter is before the courts, Mr. Speaker. But with respect to record keeping, we are committed to being an open, accountable, and transparent government. We have taken action, Mr. Speaker, uh, to strengthen the laws related to record keeping, and we have ensured that there are good policies in place for document retention and staff training. As well, Mr. Speaker, we've worked closely with the Information and Privacy Commissioner and the Chief Answer. Privacy Officer and the Archivist of Ontario to ensure that our policies are appropriate, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Well, I can tell you there's nothing appropriate about this. The former Liberal Chief of Staff to the Premier has been sentenced to jail for orchestrating the deletion of gas plant scandal documents, and this sounds absolutely identical to that. Let me read the court filings. In-house counsel for the government have refused to acknowledge or admit the destruction of incriminating energy documents, even though this has now been proven beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal proceedings. Who is this government trying to kid? The Liberals thought they were clever last time, and it ended up with jail doors slamming. Speaker, where are the documents that Trillium Power has demanded? Where are they? Thank you. The member from the PN Carleton will withdraw, and if it's said again, I'm naming people. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As said before, and I'll say it again, Mr. Speaker, to the opposition, they know that we can't comment specifically on the lawsuit from Trillium Power, as that matter is before the courts, Mr. Speaker. But in 2016, Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that Trillium requested that the OPP investigate their allegations related to the moratorium on wind energy. Those allegations were thoroughly investigated and found to be unsubstantiated, Mr. Speaker. Oh. The investigation was promptly closed after the OPP found no evidence to support Trillium's allegations, Mr. Speaker. As I said before, when it comes to respect to record keeping, Mr. Speaker, we're committed to being an open, accountable, and transparent government. We've worked closely with the Information and Privacy Commissioner and the Chief Privacy Officer Answer. and the Archivist of Ontario to ensure that our policies, Mr. Speaker, are appropriate, and they have said so. Thank you. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Final supplementary. Uh, thank you. Back to the Premier. Well, the reason there was no evidence is because it was destroyed yes. by the Liberals. Exactly. We all know that Liberal insiders have lined their pockets from the energy file for years. That could explain this section of the Trillium Power court filing referring to their competitor. Quote, unknown publicly at the time. Stop the clock. Minister of Infrastructure will come to order. Um, I might not have to wait until the first round. We'll go to warnings if necessary, and we'll do it quick. Finish, please. 
Windstream Energy has hired Chris Benedetti, a senior government relations person who had close and direct relationships into the office of the Premier, the Minister of Energy and others at the time he was a campaign co-chair for the Ontario Liberal Party in 2011. Quote, the Premier was also a campaign co-chair. Oh, yeah. Records of Benedetti's communications to and from the office of the Premier on behalf of Windstream have been wiped out, Speaker. Wow. Will the Premier tell us, are the Liberals destroying evidence what? in this case too? Question. Oh. Thank you. You see the please? You see the please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, we've taken action to strengthen the laws related to record keeping, and we, Mr. Speaker, this government has ensured that there are good policies in place for document retention and staff training. Uh, we worked with the Information and Privacy Commissioner on that, Mr. Speaker. We worked with the Chief Privacy Officer and the Archivist of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that our policies are appropriate. And that decision, Mr. Speaker, that policy to place a moratorium on offshore wind is one that our government still believes is correct, Mr. Speaker. Ontario continues to take a cautious approach to offshore wind, which includes finalizing research to make sure that we are protective of both human health health and of the environment, Mr. Speaker, because protecting the Answer. environment is something that we take very seriously. We're not going to pave over the Greenbelt, Mr. Thank Speaker. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It turns out the Premier's $6 million man has a price after all. It just happened to be a political price. Yeah. After weeks of PC leader Doug Ford sounding the siren call against outrageous executive compensation at Hydro One, isn't it wonderful to see the Premier and this governing government now following Doug Ford's yeah. lead? Thank you. Yeah. This Premier and this government, which is only interested in its own survival, finally read the political tea leaves and told the Hydro One board yep. what Doug Ford has been calling for all along, that we need a lid on fat cat executive salaries. <laughs> Speaker, to the Premier, why did it take Doug Ford and the Ontario PC party shedding a light on this scandalous deal for this government to finally act? Mr. Speaker, coming from that party where there was a video released meeting with fat cat developers, Mr. Speaker, coming from them, unbelievable. Over the weekend, Mr. Speaker, our government urged Hydro One's board to revisit its executive compensation model. And as Hydro One's largest shareholder, Mr. Speaker, we welcome the board's decision to re-examine the compensation model, which will include independent advice. The board's decision to increase executive compensation was done without our involvement, Mr. Speaker, and changes to compensation and severance were adopted by the board late last year, but were not raised with us um, before the release of the 2018 management information circular on March 29th. The board now acknowledges that its largest shareholder should be engaged on such material issues and that changes are needed. And I know, Mr. Fe Speaker, while Doug Ford and the PCs would take an erratic and reckless approach and fire Hydro One's board, which would do absolutely nothing to reduce Please customer rates, answer. we believe in a stable solution that exercises our authority as the largest shareholder. Our government continues to focus on fairness, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. Well, that weak response is only coming now because the Premier and her Millionaires Club have been exposed just before the election. If this Liberal government truly had any respect for the taxpayers, the Premier would fire the $6 million man and the entire board at Hydro. The Premier told this Legislature earlier she has the authority to do that. Then they said they don't. Now it appears they do. Instead, the Premier and her minister have stood here defending their insider friends, justifying this outrageous salaries and continuing to line their pockets. Speaker, will the Premier just admit that this deathbed conver conversion is only because she admits Doug Ford is right? Here, here. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker. The approach that the official opposition is taking is like letting a bull run through a china shop, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. They want to fire the board of a publicly traded company, not a government entity. This is incredibly, Mr. Speaker, incredibly irresponsible, and it's up to Doug Ford to explain how this would actually work, Mr. Speaker. Their gimmick will drag us down into the same mess that we've seen in the U.S. 
and won't do anything to take a cent off of anyone's bills, Mr. Speaker. And I know, as the member from Prince Edward uh, Hastings would say, Ford's scheme is chaotic and out of control. Instead of our government, we have taken a responsible approach. After hearing of the compensation changes, our government engaged in careful and necessary analysis and determined that these changes were unjustifiably generous. This weekend, Mr. Speaker, our government urged Hydro One to revisit its executive compensation model, and that's a responsible approach, Mr. Speaker. On the other side of the chamber, the official opposition is threatening to fire Thank you. Up. Final supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Let's remember what the Hydro One board did. They doubled. They doubled the severance packages for Hydro One executives while this government stood idly by doing nothing, even though they could have taken action to prevent this. Instead, they let Liberal friends line the pockets of other Liberal friends. They come first while Ontario families struggle with skyrocketing hydro bills, deciding whether to heat or eat as the winter disconnection ban comes to an end today. Well, in 38 days, the party with the taxpayers' money is over. Speaker, will the Premier stand with the people and not the millionaires and vote for our Opposition Day motion today? You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So what we have on the other side is chaotic and out of control, Mr. Speaker. They're talking about firing people left and right, which would do absolutely nothing to reduce rates for people in this province. We believe, Mr. Speaker, in a stable solution that exercises our authority as the largest shareholder. That's what we did this weekend, Mr. Speaker. That's what we'll continue to do, but we will not be voting in favour of that Opposition Day motion, Mr. Speaker, because when it comes to doing something, Mr. Speaker, they actually stand up and vote against the Fair Hydro Plan. They voted against giving families a 25 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We did hear over the last few years that people were telling us that electricity prices were too high. So we acted, Mr. Speaker. We made sure that the Fair Hydro Plan reduced rates by 25 per cent for most families, all families across the province, and those in the rural parts of our province, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and the northern part, they saw reductions anywhere between 35 per cent to 50 per cent. We acted, Mr. Speaker. The only thing they do is vote against. Thank you. No question. The member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Earlier this morning, York University professor Dr. Fred Lazar published a report that confirmed what the NDP has been saying for years. Auto insurance companies are making huge, excessive profits on the back of Ontario families. In 2016, in just one year, auto insurance companies in Ontario have made $1.5 billion in pre-tax profits. That's an increase of nearly 60 per cent since 2012. Why did the Premier deliver a 60 per cent increase in profits to the insurance companies instead of delivering 15 per cent in savings for Ontario families? Finance. Premier, Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the members uh, citing of the report by the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, uh, in which they came forward talking about some of the alarming costs that do in fact exist in our system. It is why we've taken a comprehensive plan to increase consumer protection, combat fraud, and ensure those injured in an accident get the care they need when they need it. It's about care, Mr. Speaker, and not cash, which is what we're trying to avoid in the abuse of the system. And through our auto uh, Ontario's Fair Auto Insurance Plan, we are creating independent medical examination centers. We're improving care for victims by creating a standard treatment plan for those minor injuries. Uh, that way, we avoid those whiplash and sprains and, of course, legal costs, which are also adding to the costs in the system. But the Serious Fraud Office currently costs the system $1.6 billion, Mr. Speaker. we got to curb that cost as well. Yes, so we're going to work with the Law Society on their contingency fee reforms. We're going to look on Postal Code Review, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. The supplementary. Again, back to the Premier. The Premier said it was a stretch goal to keep her promise to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. The pr Premier believed that auto insurance companies just couldn't afford to charge less. But now we know that auto insurance companies extracted an extra $5 billion in overpayments from Ontario families. 
That's $143 every year that could have stayed in the pockets of each Ontario driver. Why does this Premier care more about delivering profits for auto insurance companies that delivered instead of delivering savings to Ontario families who are being gouged? Thank you, Minister. Yeah, Mr. Speaker. So, in continuation, I mean, we have provided some regulatory reform with FISRA, Financial Service Regulatory Authority. It's a new authority to provide oversight of the auto insurance and regulatory power, increasing innovation and consumer protection, and greater supports to fight the very issues of fraud and curb those costs. Costs which now have reduced, on average, at, at one point as high as 11 percent. We know we've got to do better, and it is an issue. But we've also taken steps to put in constraints around the profits that insurance companies can make, taking the benchmark for profits down to 5 percent from 6 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've also created an expert panel that's reviewing all of these matters together so that we can work as one to ensure that we put consumers first and we address the issue of fraud, reduce the cost, thereby reducing the premiums. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. Even after gouging Ontario families and collecting an extra 60 percent in excess profits, auto insurance companies are still applying for higher auto insurance rates as they make $1.5 billion in profit and they reduce benefits for injured in auto accidents. And this Liberal government is approving them. A few weeks ago, the Financial Service Commission of Ontario approved an auto insurance rate increase of 2.23%. This was the sixth increase in the last two years. After everything, how is it possible that the Premier is still allowing auto insurance companies to gouge Ontario families even more? Thank you, Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, we uh, are instituting uh, David Marshall's review of the auto insurance system. It's very comprehensive, it's very detailed, and we know that by taking these steps, we are making long term benefit uh, changes to the reforms in the system. Uh, these are not just uh, one stop gap measures like the opposition has just proposed. Instead, we're making structural changes to put consumers first and address fraud, implementing measures that will provide timely care for victims of accidents that lead to savings for consumers. We recognize there's 120 um, auto insurance company providers out there that compete one against one another. We know that we can do better, and within the system, costs can go down, premiums should go down, and we're going to continue to fight to do just that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Oh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Status of Women. Why is the Liberal government denying funding to Niagara Women's Enterprise Centre and the Welland Heritage Council and Multicultural Centre in my riding? Thank you. Minister of the Status of Women. Thank you for your question. And I know that uh, we have been funding a number of organizations across the province. There is a system that we use to fund the organizations, and it's done on the bureaucratic side where it, everything is graded according to the criteria. Now, a number of those organizations that you've referred to, there were some programs approved, others were not approved. And from my understanding, and I can look into it for you if, that, if that's the case, but we do understand that a couple of the ones you're referencing, we have reached, the ministry has, and my staff has reached out to them to talk about why their application wasn't funded at this time. Thank, thank you. you. Chair, please. Well, thank you, Speaker. Both of these organizations have been in contact with me, and they have been declined funding for delivering programs for newcomers, women who experience domestic violence, and those who are looking for employment. Mr. Speaker, this government talks about their gender-based violence strategy, but here they are doing exactly the opposite. They're cutting funding for two important organizations Shame. who have been delivering programs in my riding for 12 years. Niagara Women's Enterprise Services, 100 to 120 women per year. They provide services to 60 women through the Investing in Futures and a total of 1,200 women through that program and 370 women through the Violence Against Women's program over the last 12 years. So, Speaker, I ask again, if the Liberals are committed to supporting women escaping domestic violence and new immigrants coming to our country, Question. why are they cutting funding to these two important agencies in my right? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, we have made a, a, up to $242 million uh, investment in our gender-based violence policy. Also, through our women's economic uh, empowerment strategy, we are, we've made an investment in our women's centres. Now, we have in, 
we have almost we've increased that investment that we're making in our women's centres now. Up until now, some of them were not getting funding. We have introduced a program where all women's centres will have access to this funding, and these are the organisations that are supporting women, our most vulnerable women, immigrant women, and women from racialized groups, women from the LGBTQ plus community. So we have done what we can. We are working hard to ensure that women who are in vulnerable places, who need our help, and we are providing those supports and those helps to the programs that we are offering, whether it be our gender-based violence policy or our women's economic women's strategy. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, these were programs that were working. Uh, and in fact, these two agencies, uh, when they tendered their, uh, put their RFP in, they had 16 endorsements from community partners. They were working with colleges, with employment centres. They had been doing a fantastic job over the last 12 years. And now here they are with no additional resources. Who is going to support the women in my riding and in my, in my community? Why is the Liberal government actually cutting funding to these programs that actually were working? Programs that supported women escaping domestic violence, support women who actually uh, experience violence in their homelands and are, are new immigrants uh, to our communities. These are the women that need it most, and I just can't understand why it is uh, these two agencies were not approved the funding that they've had for many years. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to say that there is a process when the, when applications are taken in. We have increased funding, as we've said. Yeah, we've increased yeah, our funding yeah. to up to two hundred and forty-two wow. million dollars. We are increasing funding for sexual assault centres across Ontario by thirty-five percent. We're improving access to services, including emergency shelters crisis helplines and Indigenous shelters with an investment of up to $84.2 million. Wow. We are ensuring that we're reaching out to our rural communities, our Indigenous like communities, and our most vulnerable communities. So, Mr. Speaker, we have done our best to ensure that we are reaching out to as many communities as possible through the funding that we have available, but we do have to follow a process. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Freedom of information request to both the Premier's office and Cabinet office on the Trillium Power lawsuit turned up no relevant documents. We know that the ability to go back and retrieve some documents exists. We learned that from the gas plant scandal hearings, and we learned it from the OPP. But after more than six years, we're still missing documents from this Liberal government in this court case. The Premier can't claim that it was before her time. From the court filings, quote, offshore wind and trillium power wind generated more than weekly updates after Premier Wynne had taken power. Once again, this is completely consistent with the timeline for the prior deletion wow. of the gas plant energy wow. documents, end quote. So, Speaker, to the Premier, what are you doing today to find Question. these documents that you are required for the court proceeding? Attorney General. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. Belt. And I again remind uh, the member opposite, who I know knows the rule quite well, that when there is an ongoing litigation, uh, the legislature or the question period is not the appropriate place to debate uh, what may be happening in that in that court proceeding. I know there are political cheap shots to be made, and that's why they continue to uh, to disregard a very fundamental rule that is, is in place. Uh, and so, so again, I urge, urge the member, Speaker, uh, to, to respect the process. In terms of, uh, Speaker, OPP, I do want to mention that in 2016, Trillium requested that the OPP investigate the allegations related to the moratorium on wind energy. Those investigation, uh, allegations were thoroughly investigated and found to be unsubstantiated. Ah. The investigation was promptly closed after the OPP Answer. found no evidence to support Trillium's allegations, uh, Speaker. Let's, uh, Speaker, let's talk about policy that's extremely important. This government has taken important steps uh, to protect uh, information in the government. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, that answer was eerily similar to the Premier's form of Chief of Staff, who was just sentenced to time behind bars. This is the arrogance of this Liberal government when it comes to this issue, Mr. Speaker, and enough is enough. Ontarians have heard enough excuses about this government's email and document deletions to last a generation in sentencing David Livingston last month for his role in orchestrating the gas plant cover-up. Justice Lipson wrote he was, quote, 
a politically sophisticated government actor who committed this offence because of political expediency. In other words, it was a Liberal covering up for his Liberal friends, doing what's best for the Liberal Party instead of the people of Ontario. No more, Mr. Speaker. The party's over. Speaker to the Premier, how many more Liberals are we going to discover destroyed documents? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Mr. Well, Speaker, it's, it's so I'm interesting because uh, as we're leading into an election, instead of speaking about their, their policies, they're already running away from what their leader, Doug Ford, stands for, Speaker. Instead of talking about and embracing the fact that they are going to cut the minimum wage for hardworking Ontarians or talk about how they're going to cut taxes for, for wealthy, large uh, businesses or, Speaker, to talk about how they're going to cut 45,000 hardworking wow. Ontarians who, who work as our teachers and personal support workers or, or nurses. Uh, speaker. The member from Oxford will come to order. President of the Treasury Board will come to order. Finish, please. Well, speaker, let's talk about uh, you know the policies that they stand for versus policies that we stand for. Where we want to invest in people, we want to ensure that there is more care, like health care and mental health care for, for people. We know what Doug Ford and the Conservative Party stands for, Answer. and that is to bulldoze the green belt, the precious green belt that is ensuring uh, that we Thank have you. our land protected for generations to come. Thank you. New question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier this morning. Bain Peaver has been diagnosed with dementia, and his wife, Linda, has been taking care of him ever since. In March 2017, she took a six-month leave from her career to care for him. In September 2017, she chose to quit her job, as Bain needed 24-7 care. There are programs in this rural area which she has accessed. They had 14 hours a week for a personal support worker provided by the Linz. However, Bain was classified to be in crisis. They could have had 21 hours a week. The problem is that there was no staff available to fulfill this. They could have had 180 hours a month from Vaughan, but there were only 10 spaces open, which were already filled and they had no funding for extra spaces. Question. Can the Premier tell me why this government is not investing in home care in Northern Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And of course, uh, um, we are trying to do everything we can to provide the care that uh, individuals need, um, the care that they need, where they need it. And in this particular case, uh, the question is providing home care in a, in a rural setting. We are aware that there has been uh, difficulty in uh, ensuring that we have sufficient PSW staff, as an example. And so in our budget, we have made uh, a concerted effort and uh, in the 2018 budget proposed an additional 5,000 uh, PSW workers Minister. across the province. Uh, there is an issue uh, in terms of attracting people to this very valuable service that our residents uh, need. Uh, we are also working uh, in terms yes, with the Association for PSWs to ensure they have the appropriate training as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier, Bain is now in a very good facility at the Centennial Manor in Little Current, one that I regularly visit and enjoy seeing the smiling faces of those that are there. This is a 115-kilometer round trip from her home in Mindamoya. Linda makes this trip four to five times a week. Linda chose to leave Bain in the long-term care because she was in crisis. She was burnt out and could not access Vaughan or Linz because there was no PSW to assist in giving her the little breathing space that she needed. When is this government going to invest to end the shortage of nurses and PSWs, as well as properly help people who want to care for their loved ones at their homes? Thank you. Minister. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, this is exactly why in our budget we have put so much emphasis on health care, and uh, not just the issue of PSWs that I also I just uh, recently referenced in the first question, but also all the interconnecting pieces. This is precisely why we announced that we are opening 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next couple of years. All the pieces in the health care system are very interconnected, and we are addressing each one of these pieces in a methodical and careful way in consideration of the demographics of each particular area and in each LIN. We're looking at what the needs are and we are addressing them through uh, our various budgetary commitments uh, uh, that we have made. And so we will continue to invest in our health care system. It is a world-class health care yeah. system. Yeah. There's always more to do and we intend to do it. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Lancaster, Dundas, Flamborough and Westdale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Back in 2003, Speaker, our urban communities were sprawling at a dangerous rate. And every year, tens of thousands of acres of farmland, wildlands, and wetlands, including ravines and rivers, were being encroached by new development. Ontarians were rightly concerned for both economic and environmental reasons. The great majority of people agree that to keep our communities livable, we cannot pave over every square inch of farmland and wetlands in Ontario. That's why we promised them we would take action, and we did. We, we created the largest permanent greenbelt anywhere in the world that protects nearly two million acres of valuable Question. water. Speaker, can the minister please explain again to this House and those who need to understand why our government is so committed Thank you. to protecting the green belt? Yeah. Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member for Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, and Westdale for a very, very important question, and a hard-working member he is. Speaker, our government knows how critically important it is to protect green spaces in this province. That's why we created and are committed to protecting the green belt. Uh, this is an area, Speaker, that is larger than Prince Edward Island. This is an area of some 595,000 acres of water, of lakes, rivers, streams. This is an area that protects 78 species at risk. This is an area that provides some $9.1 billion dollars in economic activity, Mr. Speaker. This is an area that grows food for Ontarians to eat. It needs to be protected. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? The member from Lanark, Front Athletics and Addington is warned. Guess what? We're in warnings. Supplementary question, the member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, a video emerged of Doug Ford discussing his promise to open up a big chunk of Ontario's Greenbelt for development. On the tape, you can clearly hear Doug Ford promise that he will open up the Greenbelt. Ask how much? Ford emphasized that he told developers he's going to open up a big chunk of it. Just like the lyrics to that famous song, Doug Ford wants to pave paradise and put up a parking lot. Wow. Right over Ontario's Greenbelt. Paving. The member from the PN Carleton is warned. I'm in this to the end. I'm not changing a thing. You should. I'm listening carefully, and I'm wanting to make sure that there's a policy question in here. Paving over the green belt is recklessly short-sighted. 
Opening up the green belt will only make rich developers richer and remove pristine farm and greenfield lands forever. The result will be endless sprawl with no green spaces in between. Question. We'll only get one chance at this. Speaker, can the minister please explain our government's efforts to protect the green belt and yep. natural green space for future? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Guelph for another uh, very important question. You know, one that, that deals with protecting important, critical green space in Ontario, land that feeds us. Talking, Speaker, you know, after that video emerged yesterday uh, where Doug Ford said that, uh, that anything they look at within the green belt uh, will be replaced. Uh, it clearly shows, Speaker, that the PC leader doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the Green Belt. He doesn't understand the importance of farmland within the Green Belt. He just doesn't understand. The Green Belt, Speaker, is a natural ecosystem that is connected. It's intertwined. You cannot simply remove pieces of it and re replace it with a piece of land from some other part of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It is all connected. Mr. Ford, he doesn't understand that. You know, worse, Speaker. The leader of the Progressive Answer. Conservative Party has already apparently made deals with big developers to pay over the Green Belt. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Thorn Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. A new report has found that grade 8 math scores improved in all areas in Canada except for Ontario. Comparing levels between 2010 and 2016, the Council of Ministers of Education Canada released the Pan Canadian Assessment Program this week and confirmed what we already knew. Math education in Ontario is deficient. Parents try to remedy the situation with tutors, but it clearly is not how taxpayers expect our education system to be run. Mr. Speaker, there has been nothing but promises and disappointment from this Liberal government when it comes to our kids. Does the minister think that it's fair that she's shortchanging our students out of a quality mathematics education? Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for this question because really it gives me a chance to make sure that I'm explaining to people what is actually happening with this Pan-Canadian Assessment Program. It's, of course, important to have a review. It's also important to know that our educators and our education system is working well and our partners are working tirelessly every day to give our kids the best start in life. And I want you to know that our government has invested more in Ontario's publicly funded education system. Uh, uh, no one has actually funded more than us. 40,000 more teachers were added, educators were added to the system since 2003. But let me just tell you this. This is actually a snapshot of what happened in 2016. It is actually not telling us where we are today. And I want to point out that that snapshot is before we move funding into the math strategy. So the $60 million in our renewed math strategy the 60 minutes of uh, a math instruction that happens in a day. This is measuring what happened before those investments are made, and I'm happy Thank to speak you. to what we're doing today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll just say that mathnasium tutoring for math are popping up all across the province, including next door to my constituency office in Thornhill, and we see a pattern here. In 2008-9, 63% of grade 6 students met the minimum proficiency level for math. 2009 10, 61%, 2010 to 12, 58%, 2012 to 13, 57%, 2013 to 14, 54%, and in 2017, we're at 50%. Half of Ontario students are not at the level that the province says we sh they should be at. And despite the alarm bells, 
Over the years, more the Canadian Math Society, the EQAO, and now the Council of Ministers of Education in Canada are telling us that grade 8 students are also at a 50 per cent level. Is the Minister of Education going to stand up and take responsibility Question. for this crisis in math Thank education? You. Thank you. So you know what, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I have full confidence in our publicly funded education system exactly. in Ontario. We are absolutely a leader when it comes to education, not just in this province or country, but around the world, and we are recognized as being a leader. We, when you were in power, 68 per cent of the students were graduating. One-third were not finishing school. Today, 86.5 per cent on average are graduating. And let me just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. It sounds to me that the member opposite is actually suggesting we should be looking at uh, privately funded schools, Mr. Speaker. It sounds to me that she has no faith in the publicly funded school system. Well, I have faith in it, and I know we're on track. We are, Ontario was one of only three provinces that scored at or above the Canadian average in all three domains, reading, Answer. math, and science. And in fact, the results show once again that Ontario students are among the top Top performers in Canada. Our publicly Thank funded you. education system was exceeded. Everyone should end that. Thank you. New question: The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the, the Prime Premier. Call Ontario used to provide cell phone and internet services to small, isolated community in Northern Ontario like Nickel Belt. In 2014, this Liberal government sold those assets to Bell Canada. Now, Bell is saying to the people of Folliette and Ivanhoe Lake, and I quote, we are seriously considering to dismantle our equipment. We are in 2018, Premier. Does, do you, does the Premier believe that Northern Ontario's students, families, businesses, outfitters, or school can go on with business as usual without access to the internet or a cell phone network. Minister of Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I spoke to the member yesterday when she raised uh, this issue with me privately. And as I indicated to her yesterday, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are looking into this particular issue uh, to get the facts around it. Uh, the property that we own through Infrastructure Ontario or the Ministry of Infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, uh, we charge rent for it on the open market. Uh, we, we sell surplus properties, Mr. Speaker. Finish, please. We sell surplus properties, Mr. Speaker. That's part of the, uh, the business of government. Uh, but it goes without saying that the loss of an entire community's in internet and cellular access would not be an acceptable outcome. As I understand it, Bell is disputing the market rate, but has not provided comparables to justify their current lease. Infrastructure Ontario and our yes, service sir. provider, CBRE, are working closely with Bell to land on a number that is mutually agreeable. And I'm confident that this Thank issue you. will be resolved, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it is no surprise to anyone from the NDP that the sell-off of Ontario will bring us trouble to communities in the North Northeast like Foliette, like Ivanhoe. We warned the government that would happen. And guess what? It did. Bell is not able to make money in Foliette and Ivanhoe. They are facing a 700 per cent increase for the infrastructure use. Bell is planning to dismantle the whole thing. We in Northern Ontario need internet and cell service like everybody else. What is this Premier going to do to protect the people, the business, the school, the outfitters, and the residents of Foliot and Hyvenal Lake so that they maintain their access to the internet and cell service now and into the future? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member should know that we've already spent $500 million on broadband and digital connection in the province of Ontario. The recent budget has added another $500 million. We have a plan in place, Mr. Speaker, before the end of this year we're going to be implementing for rural I got to do what I got to do. 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have the most aggressive broadband digital connection investments of any of the provinces in Canada. We have invested, as I said, half a billion dollars. We have another half a billion dollars in place, and I am sure that before the end of this calendar year, the member will see that we are delivering on this issue more yes, than sir. any other party has promised or as any other par party has been able to deliver to date. Thank you. New question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. In my riding of Beaches East York and in places across Ontario, we know there is just not enough purpose-built rental housing. Whether that be high-rise, mid-rise, low-rise or townhouses built for rental, there just isn't enough. To help solve the housing affordability and supply crisis, Speaker, we'll have to build more purpose-built rental. That is key. Now we know that the leader, members opposite under their leader will simply pave over the green belt in order to provide more affordable housing. And incredibly, their member, their leader, dismissed the green belt with a comment, it's just farmers' field, Speaker, an insult to agriculture workers across the province. So, Speaker, the pressures on buying and renting affordable homes can be one of the biggest challenges and weights on the shoulders of young families. In my riding, we are building purpose-built housing with options for home 360 Question. units and building with the carpenters units on, uh, made completely out of wood. So, Speaker, will the minister please share with the House the measures this government is taking to build affordable housing? Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Beaches East York for this very important question. My focus as minister is to ensure that every Ontarian has access to a safe and affordable home. And as the member said, there's a huge demand out there for purpose-built rental housing. Uh, yes, last week, Mr. Speaker, I announced uh, the allocation of $125 million in development charge rebates for Ontario mun municipalities uh, to incent purpose-built rental housing in those 13 communities with low vacancy rates. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this incentivizing developers to build affordable rental homes is good policy. Paving over the green belt will not create affordable homes, will just increase our infrastructure costs so the precious infrastructure dollars will not solve our affordable housing. Uh, situation, Mr. Speaker. We need to spend money wisely and efficiently so Thank we you. actually deliver the homes where people need them. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that response and for his intelligent approach to improving affordable housing in the province of Ontario. Speaker, over the past two decades, only 6 per cent of all housing has been built with purpose-built housing in mind. The availability of rental housing is an acute issue, especially here in Toronto. The minister knows well that at last count there was a vacancy rate of about 1%. And while there is a signal, while this is a signal of a booming and successful and vibrant economy, it also means we have a lot of work to do to build more housing for people that's affordable. And that's why initiatives like the minister just announced on development charges are so important. I'd like to congratulate the minister. I'd like to congratulate our government for advancing this investment on top of the $5 billion we're already investing in the creation of affordable housing since 2003. And I know the minister Question. was with Mayor Tory and Deputy Mayor Ann Ballyoil uh, for this announcement on Friday. So would the minister expand on the other things and the details of this announcement? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the supplementary question. Yes, indeed, last week I announced the uh, allocation of funds for Ontario municipalities to rebate development charges to incent more uh, rental housing. But, Mr. Speaker, I also announced the results of the competition uh, to develop provincial surplus lands. The West Don lands and Granville Grosvenor lands, which are in the City of Toronto, will be home to 2,150 new homes. Wow. 30% of which will be affordable. Mr. Speaker, there's another site in North Etobicoke uh, which we'll be releasing with this, and I hope uh, tomorrow perhaps to have another announcement about another site in another municipality. But, Mr. Speaker, while we're releasing surplus provincial lands in urban communities, Mr. Ford wants Answer. to pave over our green belt. Thank you. New question, the member from Nepean Carlton. 
question is to the Premier. Uh, the 400 series highways are intended to be people movers, and in the budget, the Liberals say that they will widen the 401 at the base of the 416, the 416 which, by the way, runs through Nepean and Carleton. But there is no mention of the one ask from the City of Ottawa at AMO, notably an, an additional exit to the 416 from Barhaven at Barnsdale. It's estimated that this will be a $24 million project, and I'm asking the Premier, will there be an announcement on this before the writ? Thank you. Of infrastructure. Of infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the member may know that I've already had some discussions with the City of Ottawa, that there are studies that are underway with respect to that particular uh, site. Uh, I agree with the member that there's a need in that particular location uh, in the Peen, Mr. Speaker. But really, we are doing a lot of infrastructure. We've, we've put a lot in place now, Mr. Speaker. We're planning a lot more. But the other side has nothing planned, Mr. Speaker, for any kind of roads or transit make any kind of sense, Mr. Speaker. But I'm waiting for the supplementary for the punchline, Speaker. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, maybe the minister shouldn't embarrass himself, and he should just ask the uh, answer the question. He knows as well as I do that 29% of the growth in the last four years has happened in Barrie. I mean, it's accounted for the highest growth in Ottawa. We are now 90,000 people strong, with only one exit onto the 416. Think of Kempville on the same highway, or cities of smaller or similar size like Brockville or Kingston or Belleville on the 401. They all have multiple exits. The 416 could be maximized as a people mover if only we had this additional exit. Inside of Barhaven, we have six rail crossings that we would love to divert traffic from by encouraging an accessible and convenient entry westward onto the 416. So the minister can spare me with his antics and he can answer the question. I have a clear okay. ask from the city of Ottawa. Can we expect an announcement this week or we just sit Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the member not to hold her breath for Doug Ford to do any of that work. Yeah. When asked about support for local transit and highway projects in London, Doug Ford said, we'd never leave any commitment. We're going to review everything, and nothing is going untouched, Mr. Speaker, including the plans that we have in place for Nepean, Mr. Speaker. Similarly, when he was in Cornwall, Mr. Speaker, last week, he said, and this is reported from the Cornwall Standard Freeholder. Doug Ford said he would be willing to help the city of Cornwall with its infrastructure deficit if he's elected Premier in June, but only if municipalities across the province start cutting what a PC government would deem as wasteful spending. Not only does he want to cut, Speaker, he wants the municipalities to cut. It's a disease, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Thank you. <laughs> I do remind uh, members who are in warnings and that there are people already being warned, that have been warned. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When the TTC is properly funded, it actually works. I don't know if you've been on a street or a subway lately, but they are very overcrowded. When the provincial government funded 50 per cent of TTC's net operating costs, it was the envy of the world. But the Conservative government cut this funding in 1998, and in fact today the TTC is the least funded major transit agency in North America, and as a result, transit service keeps getting worse, while fares keep getting higher. The Liberal government has had 15 years to reverse these Conservative cuts. Why have you not done so? Um, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I think I first went on the subway in 1958, so I've been on the subway for many, many years, have ridden the subway, and I know what a terrific and important service it is. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately in this province, you know, if we had built, if we had built transit every year since, uh, since 47, 49, when, uh, when the subway was first uh, opened, Mr. Speaker, we'd be in a very different position. It took until now, Mr. Speaker, for our government to actually make investments in transit. 
budget, Mr. Speaker, to actually have a long-term infrastructure plan that includes transit. The Department, the Ministry of Transportation, Mr. Speaker, you know, used to be called the Department of Highways in 1916. That's the only place there was long-term planning. That's the world that Doug Ford wants to go back to, where we just pave over the province, Mr. Speaker. What we have done is we have changed the trajectory of infrastructure in this province. Transit is a part of our long-term plan, Mr. Speaker. We're in the process of building transit more than any government in the history of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, provincial funding for TTC operations was cut by the Conservatives in 1998, and it has stayed cut under the Liberal Party. And now the Liberals are borrowing another bad Conservative idea. They have proposed to break up the TTC and take over the subways. Riders don't want fragmented transit service with different fares and operators for buses, streetcars and subways. The TTC needs proper funding, not a change in ownership. Will the government listen to transit riders who want the provincial government to properly fund the TTC, not break it up? And will the government restore the province's 50 per cent funding for municipal transit operations like the NDP has committed to? Because it's not 1958 anymore, Premier. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, for a party that is looking to govern this province, they have, on so many significant issues, no plan whatsoever, Mr. Speaker. Item after item after item in terms of transit, transportation, has come before this House for votes. They have voted against virtually every one of them, Mr. Speaker, and they still today they have no plan. After years of voting against the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, the NDP has finally realized that government needs to invest in schools, hospitals, and public transit that people rely on, Mr. Speaker. You know what? Fortunately, Mr. Speaker, we have another four or five weeks to go before Election Day, and hopefully the people of Ontario will see something realistic and practical from that party, yes, Mr. Speaker. I do. I do. New question. The member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Status of Women. Mr. Speaker, this month is Sexual Assault Prevention Month. It's an important time to raise awareness about the devastating impact of sexual assault and focus on what we can all do to stop violence and support survivors. We must also recognize that sexual assault is far too widespread in our society and our communities, and we must pledge to do better. I know that this government has done extraordinary work to prevent and address sexual assault by introducing It's Never Okay, an action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment in 2015. And most recently, we promised in the first strategy we launched part two, It's Never Okay, Ontario's strategy to end gender-based violence with an investment of up to $242 million, as the minister stated earlier this morning. Question. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please update the House on the ongoing work being done to shift societal norms around consent and sexual violence and harassment? Thank you, Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for this important question. Sexual violence is far more common than most people think. One in three women will experience some form of sexual violence in her lifetime. We know that gender-based violence is a result of normalized misogyny, rape culture, and toxic masculinity. And, Speaker, as long as women and girls face the threat of violence in this, pro uh, in this province, our work will continue. We must do better, and we will. This, um, this year, women have stood up with great courage and resilience to say, me too, and time's up. And we have responded to this call for action with our newest strategy, It's Never Okay, Ontario's Gender-Based Violence Strategy. We are improving services and supports for survivors. In fact, our government is expanding access to counselling, crisis telephone lines, emergency shelters, transitional housing, sexual assault centres, and legal supports. We are Answer. investing in victim services programs that provide trauma-informed supports to survivors of sexual or domestic violence and human trafficking. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. 
It is certainly very clear that gender-based violence is a result of normalized misogyny, and I ask that each member of this House consider that term carefully. We need to move beyond, and I am so glad that we are, wearing purple to bring awareness to violence against women. I'm pleased to hear that our new gender-based based violence strategy invests in so many critical supports for survivors. But, Speaker, we know that more needs to be done to promote the conversation and shift attitudes and biases around sexual violence and harassment. We all have an important role to play, and we need to bring partners to work with us to raise awareness and bring about change. Many survivors have told us that they've faced barriers in accessing the help that they Question. need, and this is unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to address these needs? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague again for her question and her advocacy on this important issue. Our gender-based violence strategy is based on the, uh, the advice of frontline workers and experts. In particular, I'd like to thank the Violence Against Women Roundtable for their tire tireless efforts and their leadership. Our strategy is going to get programs and funding out into communities that need it. As a part of our up to $242 million strategy to end gender-based violence, we are expanding our creative engagement fund to support artistic projects that raise awareness. We're investing in professional development and innovation expansion through new bystander and community training. We're extending and expanding our free independent legal advice for survivors of sexual assault province-wide so that survivors can get the advice on their uh, on their options at any point, and we recognize that certain groups are at greater risk of violence. That's why we are piloting Canada's Answer. first ever dedicated LGBTQ plus community legal clinic and facilitating training for more than 70 community legal clinics across the province. When it comes to the well-being of women and girls in the province, this government has always been Thank there, you. and we will be there to continue to do the work necessary. Question the member from Simcoe Gray. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues and I have been raising concerns uh, with this government about the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program since it was created over one year ago. The minister has said he would review and fix the program, but farmers in my riding and right across the province continue to tell us that they face huge livestock losses and that they're receiving no compensation. 20 per cent, or one in five claims for predation kills, is, are rejected by the program. Mr. Speaker, the inaction by this government is inexcusable. I ask the minister, when will he fix this program and give farmers the compensation they're entitled to, and will that compensation be retroactive, as the program it hasn't been working for the last year and a half? Thank you. And well, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Right reply from my colleague Simcoe Gray. Indeed, it was brought to my attention that there were some challenges with the wildlife uh, compensation program. I actually went in field to many farmers uh, across the province of Ontario. Farmers. I've been right there when I've seen sheep and cattle that have been attacked uh, by predators, and it was based on that information that we decided to review the program. We engaged the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, Christian Farmers Union, other people, and we've now come up uh, with a plan that we're going to be implementing shortly. We're going to have consistent trading standards right across the province of Ontario. So there's no deviation. When an evaluator goes out, we'll say, from a community in the county of Peterborough will be exactly the same as someone from the county of Simcoe. But let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, now we know the true aims of the asphalt Answer. farmer from Etobicoke paving over the green belt. That's true. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 2, 3 p.m. this afternoon.